others others will join as needed. I want to say first thanks for everybody for joining us today. I'm really glad to see the turnout. Uh, my name is John Dearborn. Um, I'm based in the Agriculture and Food Global Engagement Unit at the World Bank, here today representing the Global Alliance for Food Security, otherwise known as GAFS, uh, with my colleague Genevieve, and I'll turn it over to her for her to introduce herself, and then over to our other colleague and speaker today, Stephen Flower. Thanks, Jen, over to you, and then to Stephen. Thank you, John. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Genevieve Theodorikis, and I am working as an agriculture economist with the Global Engagement Unit of the World Bank's Food and Agriculture Practice with John. Thank you. Over to you, Stephen. Thank you, Genevieve. Thank you, John. I'm Stephen Flower I'm from the IT Secretariat, and um, we're working with the GAFS partnership uh, to use IT data from work that was originally started with OCHA um, some year ago or so. So really happy to continue this. So thanks again, everybody, for joining us today to talk about how IATI and GAFS are partnering to enhance food security and nutrition financial tracking. <clears throat> we'll kick it off with Genevieve to give us an overview of the Global Alliance, and then I'll come in for an overview of the Food Security Crisis Preparedness Plans, an initiative supported by GAFS, and the specific links between these plans and IATI. And then Stephen will give us an overview of the IATI and GAFS collaborations to date, as well as our plans for the future. Then afterwards, we'll have some time for discussion and questions related to the presentation. Thanks again. Jen, over to you. Perfect. Thanks, John. So as John mentioned, um, to help set the scene for today's discussion, I'm happy to provide a high-level overview of the Global Alliance for Food Security um, and related activities under the Global Food and Nutrition Security Dashboard. Um, so over the last several years, acute food insecurity has steadily increased globally and by 2022, an estimated 258 million people required urgent humanitarian assistance to meet their food needs. Uh, next slide, please. The war in Ukraine really exacerbated an already worsening acute food insecurity situation at the global level. But the war has also provided an opportunity to improve food and nutrition security responses, um, notably by enhancing information sharing, and coordination on policy and financial response between humanitarian and development partners. Um, you know, I think there's there's been a, a lot of work within the humanitarian domain as well as in the, de the development domain. And, and uh, there's been a, a great opportunity to exploit, to, to enhance linkages between these two um, sets of actors. Next slide, please. So these opportunities really paved the way for the establishment of the Global Alliance for Food Security. In May of 2022, the German G7 presidency and the World Bank launched GAS to catalyze an agile and coordinated response to the global food crisis, together with a wide array of partners, notably IATI. And uh, we're happy to say that in a short time, GAS was able to convene over 60 partners that span the humanitarian and development space across governments, donors, multilateral organizations, UN agencies, technical institutions, civil society, and the private sector. Next slide, please. And so this slide just provides a, a brief overview of some of the key partners that have been involved um, in the formation of GAFs and the, and the development of our activities together. Next slide, please. So based on the challenges that have been raised by growing levels of acute food insecurity, GAFS partners have identified four priority areas on which to really concentrate their energies. So firstly, the advice section um, of the, the, the advice focus area of the, of the GAFS really works to provide the latest data and assessments on food crisis severity. Um, the action focus area seeks to track food security and nutrition financing. Um, the advanced focus area prevents, uh, presents forward-looking research in order to enhance resilience against food crises. And then finally, over the last few months, GAFS partners have worked on the fourth focus area, which is entitled ALERT, um, to support countries in enhancing crisis uh, preparedness. 
through the preparation of food security crisis preparedness plans. Um, these focus areas are visualized in the Global Food and Nutrition Security Dashboard, which I will describe on the next slide. Next slide, please. Thanks, John. So in June of 2022, GAFS partners highlighted the need to bring together the latest information on food and nutrition security in a sort of one-stop shop platform in order to help facilitate decision-making and also strengthen crisis response. This motivated the development of the Global Food and Nutrition Security Dashboard in November of 2022, uh, which was developed by the World Bank together with partners like IATI, UN OCHA, FAO, WFP, and many other key partners. The work and recognition of the dashboard over the last year has really demonstrated its value add in a number of areas. Uh, so firstly, I'd say by bringing together FNS data from over 40 GAFS partners in one place, the dashboard has allowed for a, a common understanding of available data and assessments. And this information has also aided decision makers um, uh, in crisis response and preparedness at the country and global levels. Um, and more broadly, it's helped to facilitate coordination of efforts across the humanitarian and, uh, and development space. And it's important to highlight as well that the dashboard is truly a consensus-based effort. So essentially all um, information that's provided, that's highlighted on the dashboard um, is, is developed through an iterative process with numerous technical focal points of GAFS partners. Next slide, please. So this slide summarizes some key achievements to date in numbers for the GAFS dashboard. Um, since the launch, the dashboard has featured data from over 40 data partners and integrated over 25 selected indicators. Uh, these data sets cover um, between anywhere between 43 countries to up to 194 countries for some indicators. Um, and the visuals display all together uh, uh, and it really facilitates the identification of, of data gaps, I'd say. Um, and we're happy to say as well that the dashboard has attracted a growing number of visitors from all over the world. Um, and it's been globally recognized as well as an important tool in high level FNS action statements and plans, um, such as the Hiroshima Statement for Resilient Global Food Security, um, as well as the joint statements by FAO, um, the IMF, the World Bank, WFP, and the WTO. Um, moreover, GAFs in the dashboard have really helped to facilitate enhanced dialogue um, and strengthened partnerships among humanitarian and development actors. Next slide, please. So during today's presentation, I'll just give a brief high-level overview of two of the GAFs focus areas um, to help set the scene for my fellow presenters. Um, under the action module, which is visualized on the screen now, the dashboard has collated data and collaborated with OECD DEC, OCHA FTS, IATI, of course, and the Global Network Against Food Crises to feature food and nutrition financing information. At the global level, it provides an overview of humanitarian funding for food security, nutrition, um, and uh, other sectors, other related sectors. And it also highlights aid financing flows destined to agriculture, food security, nutrition, and rural development, and offers total funding aggregates for a given year. At the country level, the action section also offers detailed insights um, by showing the shares of these sectors as a percentage of total humanitarian or development funding for a specific country. Um, and we're excited to say that in terms of next steps for um, the action section, the team is currently working with partners in order to create a standardized method for tracking contingency resources um, in order to enhance the effectiveness of crisis response and preparedness efforts. And the basis for this work really lies with our collaboration with IATI. Um, but of course, successful implementation will require collaboration and active participation from, from the rest of the GAS partners as well uh, to ensure widespread uptake um, and effectiveness. Next slide, please. 
And uh, so the alert module is actually the latest addition to the dashboard, uh, which we integrated last month in order to live track the development of food security crisis preparedness, um, which my colleague John will elaborate on in more detail shortly. Uh, the global map allows dashboard users to receive essentially a, a snapshot view of the latest information on the status of these plans. Um, and users also have the ability to go into the country profiles to get more re uh, detailed information on when workshops were held, what the agenda was, and what some of the key outputs from those meetings were. Uh, so at the moment, 25 countries are currently developing food security crisis preparedness plans of which eight have draft plans and are currently being refined. Um, our upcoming priorities for the alert section include the finalization, of course, of these FSCPPs, while also developing additional support mechanisms to publicize alerts triggered um, by the FSCPP process and also facilitate coordination at the global level. Uh, so that's it from my side. Thank you very much for your attention. With that, I turn over to my colleague, John Dearborn. John? Thanks, Genevieve. So I'll get into a little bit here on what exactly are these FSCPPs and how are they linked to IATI? So first, what is an FSCPP other than a very cumbersome adjective that I, to this day, will still mispronounce? The Food Security Crisis Preparedness Plan, or the FSCPP, is a national operational plan that defines what constitutes a major food and nutrition security crisis for a country. The plan also explains how um, crisis risks are actively monitored and identified and details step-by-step -step protocols, roles, and timelines for mobilizing additional funding and early action. So the development and the rollout of these plans, as Genevieve mentioned, are being supported by the Global Alliance. So. In terms of major acute shocks, what does that actually mean? Of course, we have droughts, floods, locusts, COVID-19 pandemic, Ukraine war. It really depends on the country, what their exposure is, and the degree of impact that these crises have on a country. But part of these preparedness plans is bringing some standardization to the recognition of whether a country is facing a major uh, food security shock. And why is this? It's because we want to recognize these major risks and shocks as early as possible and then get this collective action going across development and humanitarian actors as quickly as possible. So the main objective of these plans is really to get ahead of this crisis and limit its impact, which therefore can save lives, resources, and livelihoods. And then also just from a development standpoint, we wanna safeguard these long-term uh, development investments that are addressing these chronic root causes of food insecurity. And we don't wanna see the development envelopes depleted going towards the response to what we are seeing as these more frequent uh, major crises. And then we also want to share uh, the burden across government development and humanitarian actors to maximize the amount of response. And in terms of this response, these plans can tap into additional contingency financing where possible. So it's not just the World Bank, but other donors, partners, bilateral agencies, uh, what resources they have to respond to a food security crisis. And we also want to shift our attention from a, this more siloed approach to more collective uh, recognition and action for these crises. So what actually goes into these plans? Um, as I mentioned, we want to identify this crisis as soon as possible and then mobilize action and financing to respond as quick as possible. So to do so, the first step is to identify the problem, which you consider element one. And ideally, and ideally the, the recognition of this would, would, would be outlined in a consolidated food and nutrition security um, otherwise known as FNS. You're going to hear me say FNS a lot during this presentation just for the sake of time. Um, but this FNS report is going to be developed on a regular basis, ideally every three months, and it brings together all agencies across development, humanitarian government actors who are tracking these relevant food security indicators within a country. And then it will outline the, the current status of these indicators. So we'll be able to get this data under element one, which gives us insight on these risk drivers and the status of these risk drivers. And then this information will be sent to a food and nutrition security programmatic working group, uh, which includes government ministries, UN agencies, humanitarian actors, development actors, and also NGOs or CSOs. And the function of this group will just be to share information, discuss the status of FNS programming within a country, but the most critical function is that when there is a new FNS report, 
uh, risk report. They decide whether the country is facing a major crisis and whether existing programs in a country can respond to the crisis, and if not, whether it should be escalated to senior officials, which are basically the senior counterparts of the representation at the programmatic working group. This group will ultimately decide whether to trigger the FSCPP or not, and this is the third element of the plan. So once this plan is triggered, there are a number of actions which take place. First, to solve the issue of joint recognition, there will be a joint statement about declaring um, a food security crisis. And it's about a call to action of all partners to scale up and respond to the plan. Uh, there's no obviously no obligation for partners on the, around the table to respond. Each has their own decision-making structure, but the statement say that there is a major issue and puts the responsibility on partners to mobilize a response. In addition, mechanisms we've set, put in place for senior officials to be briefed on the status of the crisis and the status of the response. And are we seeing results? Um, now for the global picture. So we have this reporting system. We have the programmatic group, which will decide whether to escalate to a senior officials group who will then decide whether to trigger the plan or not. And now comes the issue of raising this global attention and support to respond to the crisis. And that's where this global architecture is coming into play, which is being supported by the Global Alliance for Food Security. So once a national trigger occurs, the secretariat, which will be run by GAFs, will be notified and we will convene a group of global food and nutrition security principles across development, humanitarians, donors, and IFIs to promote collective awareness that this country has triggered their plan and all partners are called on to respond. Now, this is a resource mobilization effort and not just humanitarian, but across the entire aid system. And this is where the collaboration with IATI is especially needed. When the partners are called on to respond, we want to be able to track the status of this response and identify if the needs outlined by a country and the triggering of their FSCPP are being met. And so therefore we need a system to track whether we are, you know, what we're terming as this FNS, food and nutrition security contingency financing, which are the resources being used to address these food security crises. So defining contingency financing for FNS is, is essential to establish a clear framework for what we're tracking uh, using IAE. Um, and this is contingency resources, what is this? It's opposed to highlighting the general trends in an agency's humanitarian and development envelopes, which are already being captured broadly by the JetGAFS dashboard. Uh, it's better to specific, pinpoint some specific financing facilities, vehicles, instruments, which can be activated when a major crisis emerges. So in other words, the objective is to capture how an institution can respond to an unplanned FNS shock, such as by mobilizing funding, which was not previously guaranteed, planned, or earmarked. And in this regard, the framework should track these three distinct financing modalities. Um, so the first one, I'm kind of going out of order here, the new funding modalities. Um, these resources represent some um, new funding, which is additional to already existing and or planned funding. Uh, which can be mobilized. For some donors, mobilizing new funding may require approval by senior administration, congresses, parliaments, or boards. Uh, it could also include raising additional funding in the markets or via special appeals. So an example of this would be the World Bank's more recent mobilization of around 12 billion uh, for the Ukraine crisis. Um, the second is this reallocation of existing funding modalities. And so these resources do not represent the new or additional funding that I just mentioned, but financing which has been reallocated or shifted from some existing portfolios to respond to an FNS crisis. Some partners may have discretion or specific modalities such as crisis modifiers to reallocate funds across country or regional portfolios. For instance, at the country level, the World Bank can activate a contingent emergency response component for CERC, which can be embedded in a project and used to reallocate funding from standard project operations in the event of an emergency. And then lastly, we have these dedicated or special contingency financing facilities, vehicles, instruments, windows, essentially. Essentially, these are these rainy day funds, right? Uh, these are designed to respond specifically to emerging uh, food and nutrition security crises. For some, these are set-asides which may have the FNS crises written into their modus operandi, um, whereas others may have a more general slash global pool of contingency resources that can be drawn upon for various crises. So some examples of these might be the FAO Special Fund for Emergency and Re Rehabilitation, IMF Food Shock Window, a United Nations Central Emergency Respond Fund, SURF, and the World Bank's crisis response window, early response financing. 
So with the goal of tracking the, the mobilization of these specific buckets of financing in mind, there are a number of challenges that exist in bringing this into a reality. Um, the first would be that access to timely and accurate information uh, for FNS is a cornerstone of the FSCPP. When a plan is triggered, time is of the essence. We need to gather, consolidate, and analyze the current state of these resources as quickly as possible to make these informed decisions that will ultimately be able to save lives. Um, currently, we're relying on existing FNS data that we're pulling from IATI, but that doesn't necessarily separate these existing uh, FNS portfolios from the types of contingency financing that we want to track specifically as a response to a food crisis. Gathering information on these specific contingency financing resources flowing from organizations towards a, uh, a country's FSCPP is therefore a labor-intensive process. Uh, it can be conducting individual bilateral consultations with, with each partner in a given country to collect this necessary information, and it's not sustainable in that way. So while our goal is to be much more proactive and gather this as quickly as possible, we face this challenge that there is not a systemic, a systematic approach, approach that exists that can comprehensively track this, this financing and reduce the level of, of resources needed by manual bilateral data collection. So even if we can gather this information systematically, maintaining this updated database also remains a significant challenge. But to tackle these challenges, we've attempted to fill some of the gaps and we're currently developing this dedicated system capable of, of automating the request, tracking and updating of this FNS contingency financing information. And we're working, as I mentioned, with IATI to create this system. We're currently in a bit of an ideas phase, but we have begun discussions with, with Stephen Flower, who will speak after me and his team, uh, to put in place the system which can distinguish these contingency resources from the existing FNS resources that we're currently pulling from IATI, essentially highlighting this response. And I'll hand it over to Stephen now uh, to talk a little bit more about what this system entails and how we intend to do so. But uh, beforehand, I, I believe he'll also talk about some of the existing details or the details of the existing partnership between GAFS and IATI, what we've done so far. Uh, so thanks, Stephen. Over to you. Um Thank you, John. Thank you, Jean-Viev. Uh, that's really helpful context about 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 this work. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, this this uh, we started working together a year ago when I was at the Center for Humanitarian Data in uh, in Ocha, actually, and I hope David Megerson might be here as well to join to to listen in. Um, prior to that, we made a we made a, a dashboard about the COVID response, the, res the response to the COVID pandemic, where we were tracking IATI data for the funds that were. Uh, allocated towards COVID response, and so I know the team at GAFS saw that dashboard and were really interested in that work and that and that particularly the methodology we used to find IATI data that may be relevant to COVID. So when we started first working with the GAFS team, we thought, okay, we could we could use what we've done here, and uh, instead of looking for the word COVID, let's look at for the word food security or food insecurity, uh, but also in in collaboration with colleagues at the FAO. We, we, we started to do searches around IATI around sector codes because, um, as colleagues might know, there's no single sector code for food and nutrition security. So the challenge was there's lots of organizations already publishing this data. As John mentioned, the, the, we didn't want to re, GAFS didn't want to recollect this information. So how could we find that information from IATI publishers and then use that in, in the dashboard? At this stage in the, um, as jean Vier, um pointed out, the advice section, the funding that might already be around um, food and nutrition security. So we set that up and, and that worked quite quickly because uh, as we all know, I, I, organizations are publishing IATI data quickly and methodically and, and comprehensively in many cases. Uh, and we got a lot of information back that could be used by the team on the GAFS dashboard. That was good in many places, but mixed in others. And uh, as we all know, in, in IATI land, that, that's often the case. We, we find differences in publication methods and different models of practices of, of, of publishing IATI data. So although that gave us a really strong foundation, um, we, we wanted to move move ahead with this and, and understand what we could do next. And since then as well, uh, I should note that uh, in the in the changes with the Secretariat, the, the GAFS team have now started to work directly with the IATI data store to, to search and find this information. So we, we hope that we can we can support them there. So that's the first context really about how do we find FNS data 
in amongst IATI data amongst all the different organizations and we made a, a good a good headway into that and so next slide please John Mo moving on really to the um, to the aspect of the um, the FSCPPs now uh, John mentions that's a, a, a cumbersome acronym but it's also a unique it's a unique string actually in in, in IATI quite helpfully so uh, I think the, the next conversation we're having and the next focus we want to have with GAFs and with with organizations publishing data in, in amongst IATI is uh, how can we how can organizations publishing be far more clearer and annotate their data to declare this is a response to an FSCPP uh, and and really help GAFs find the data and use that within within the, the dashboard and such things. So instead of us doing broad search and, and assuming it's related to food, uh, food and nutrition security by using the FSCPP tag as i'll call it we hope and we plan and we and we and we really want to find out uh, if it's possible for organizations to annotate tag their data accordingly so that concretely i think means uh maybe uh concretely means using a new tag vocabulary in the ATI standard so that organizations can say this activity is re is related to the fscpp in for example somalia and we'll work out a way that for organizations to do that. But alongside that, we don't, we don't want to be fixed on just the tag. We recognize things like uh, uh, the tag can't be used at the transaction level, for example. So like, like we did with COVID and other things, having good guidance about how you could annotate your data to declare that this is uh, related to a, a certain FSCPP. Um, and I think that's going to be really interesting, really important, the, the bilateral and community discussions we have about what is the best way to, to, to really share and, and push through data that you want to be used for a certain part, because the foundation we have with IIT is that it's been published already and we don't want to reinvent, reinvent the wheels. Um, I think in amongst that, there's a really important challenge for us. Uh, John mentioned the different modalities of funding, uh, and we know um, that might be challenging about how we determine that from IATI data, for example, with transactions or aid types or other things. So we're welcoming, again, discussions about how, how could we track repurposed funding in, among, in IATI transactions. I think it's an open discussion to have uh, there. But certainly the foundation of the broad search and now the more targeted uh, annotation of data we, we think can help uh, GAFs realize what, where funding is being targeted. And so to help that, the final slide from me, John, and, and then of course we can have questions and, and discussion. Um, to help that, um, we we certainly want to uh, talk ongoing with the community. And, and so we, we, we plan and hope to re, um, launch, have a community of practice around food and nutrition security to engage people who are involved in FSCPPs and GAFs, but also others that have worked in this area already and that, that have found ways to find this data, for example. So it's about sharing methodologies, but also talking specifically about the, the, some of the challenges that we have around repurposed funding, for example. Uh, and I should say that what, what's quite interesting and exciting here, I think we can establish a community of practice in IATI amongst all the, and, passionate IATI people that we know in many of the agencies, but also GAFs have uh, active communities of, of domain specialists that, that know, know this, this, this world uh, very well. So I'm hoping that between GAFs and IATI, we can have a, a community of practice that exchanges both domain and technical know-how and other things, rather than just have a, a singularity, for example, with a IATI uh, alone. So I think one way to do that, uh, talking with John, I think GAFs could host a quarterly community call, bring in domain expertise, and, and we in the IATI world can bring together IATI specialists to discuss these very clear uh, or emerging topics about how do we use IATI data for for these uh, uh, emerging um, for these emergencies. Um, so that's where we are in terms of using IATI data and what we plan and how we really hope to to work with. Uh, uh, publishers and community uh, to, to further that. Back to you, John. Thank you. Thanks very much, Stephen. So now we'll have some time. It looks like we have about 15 or so minutes before the end of the session to have a chance for Q&A or discussion related to, the, um, related to the presentation. I see that there is some chat notifications, but I can't see the chat. So Maybe Genevieve, if you could help me out, if there's any questions in the chat, first of all, um, would you mind sharing those with us? Thanks, John. 
I'm not seeing any questions for now um, in the actual chat, but colleagues, please feel free to either write in the chat or raise your hand if you have any questions about the presentation. Thank you. Or, or just feel free to comment as well. I mean, if, if, if you'd like to just jump in, that would be great with any questions or, or, or comments. Uh, yep. Jonah, I, I see that um, David from Ocho is, is here. I just have seen him in chat. So uh, not to put the spotlight on John, uh, on David, but uh, this issue of IATI data and, and pinpointing specific things, have you any thoughts, David, on, on this, just to get, get the discussion going? If, you, if you're still here. Yes, I am. Just uh, scrambling for a headset. I thought I'd be a passive audience today. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I've got to take off my camera protector too. Can you, you can probably see me now. Thank you. Yeah, um, brilliant. Right. Yeah, th thank you for the call out. Um, it was um, a great experience when you were at the center, um, Stephen, developing that algorithm to actually extract usable funding, deduplicated funding data from IATI, and I'm excited to see it being used somewhere else. Um, what, what kinds of uh, tweaks did you have to make to it? Uh, you mentioned sector codes. Uh, what other tweaks did you end up making to make it work for um, food security and nutrition? I, I think we I think we found the same uh, the similar issues that we did with the COVID project as well. So we we could we could get to a subset, but we found, for example, lots of false narratives. I think you know this project, you know, this activity is not about food food insecurity. Is a, is is an extreme example, but I think that it's that it's that balance between automating the the catch of the data versus hand curating the data that we really need. So I think mm -hmm. moving on and this uh, this this idea of uh, directly annotating parts of the data for use for the use of GAFs is quite in, is really interesting, uh, and it'd be great to hear perhaps if there are publishers as well here that. That might might but what we want to understand next is is it possible for your publication systems to do this for example um, so the algorithm is great as it, as you say david but it's the it's the certainty is it is it about fns or is it about fscpp yes or no is the, is the real question sometimes exactly and I'll, I'll just just before we go on to other things uh, in case this triggers some discussion too i remember a big problem that we encountered at the time was giant umbrella projects and transactions of which covered not only COVID in our case, it would be food security, nutrition in yours, but many other things as well. And the lack of disaggregation or separate, um, you know, sector tagging or whatever for the transactions was a huge hindrance to knowing how much of this money is actually intended for food security. I know they can give um, sector breakdowns by percentage, mm -hmm. but it was often very hard for us to know if somebody had a $5 million project for Somalia and it covered, you know, long laundry lists of sectors. And then we have individual transactions going to partners. How much of this is really COVID? And you must be running into the same thing over. Yes, thank you, David, exactly that as well. And I think that then plays into uh, the, the funding modalities the GAFS team are looking at as well. It's, so it's not just the size of the transactions that we could find in IIT, but then also the what, can we understand if this transaction is a repurposed from a previous funding decision or it's going into a, a, a pot, a, a pooled fund, for example? I think we can, I think we can with IIT determine some of that by looking at what the activity is already, because if it's a pooled fund, we might be able to see from so various codes, but it's an added complexity as well. And so, Totally, I agree with you. Yeah, you know, it's not just the it's not just the differences in the activities and the data, but the the, the size of the commitments disbursements, which might um, give us a more more challenge here. But nevertheless, I keep saying, but the FAO and others are publishing this data already. So it's it's a it's a it's a data use project that's really important. It's not just a a reporting mechanism that we're adding on. It's 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 making the data more more valuable. Yeah, and again, I I just want to echo that. In order to kind of sift through this and pull exactly what we need uh, from the IATI system to track for these FSCDPs, it's going to require some considerable coordination, which is kind of the idea of, of establishing this community of practice, which will be led by, by GAFs, and we'll be building upon the GAFs action focus area, which is an already established, as Stephen mentioned, 
an already established group of partners. Some of these are, in fact, most of these are major partners that are reporting this, this FNS data via IADI to work with them either in this quarterly meeting or bilaterally to uh, work together to, to see how we can better report this data that can disaggregate it in a way that, that makes sense for the uh, for the for the dashboard and the FSCP piece. I, I see Alex Miller has a hand up. Yep, thank you. Uh, thank you all for the very interesting presentation. Um, so my, my question was, I, I think we can agree that having existing tag codes um, in place uh, for filtering data is is better than working with sort of unstructured text data and sifting through narratives that might have false positives. Um, but obviously it's hard to get those existing pieces of guidance or codes um, in place for a, a rapidly emerging situation like COVID or, or other sorts of emergencies. Um, so I'm just wondering how we could start to think of approaching um, filling the need for having those pieces of guidance or tags in place um, before there is that that next COVID that we need to, to anticipate? Thank you. Right, and, and that's a great question. I mean, obviously we're going to need to sensitize our partners to this so that they're able to effectively use this tag when it is appropriate and um, at the correct time. And so that's something actually we're also going to be leading with the Global Alliance. I mean, as I mentioned, we have partners at FAO, WFP, uh, EFAD, the Global Network Against Food Crises. These are the partners and gas that we're going to be reaching out to, as well as bilateral donors and some of um, the other IFIs that are members of GAFS um, via the GAFS Action Focus Area. Uh, we'll be providing them a guiding note, a guidance note, and then also separate um, informal trainings in the quarterly community of practice meetings to ensure that everybody understands exactly which tag to use, how to use it, when to use it. And then we're using the, the convening power of the Global Alliance to really get this information out there. Um, again, will require a considerable amount of, of coordination, um, but that's um, that's something that the Global Alliance really, really can address here. Thanks. Thanks, Alex, that's, that's really helpful as well. I, I, and I totally agree that uh, uh, how do we get the, the tags in use and operation part of the business process that are already going on so i think with gaffs particularly it's really interesting to see the models they have already and where and how we can introduce those tags in iati in, in tandem with them and i think as well that that could also be something we have to look at with the humanitarian response plans and other 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 codes and tags we want to see in use in iati as quickly as possible uh, so certainly there are john a couple of other questions in the chat there's if you can see uh that um, I can see the chat, but maybe if you just uh, okay. if Jen, uh, Stephen can read some off. Yeah, so so Micah, uh, if you if you your question about um, if if used to address food crisis isn't articulated too late, aren't people already funding existing food security projects instead of new ones? Uh, Micah, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that question. If, you, if you're still here. Yes, I am here. I'm having a bit of a challenge with. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, the yeah, so, so I was thinking, you know, normally people publish and then they already indicate uh, this is a project we do on food security without an existing food crisis per se. I mean, it can also be just uh, nutrition focused. Um, so do, is it then about reverting funds of existing projects to the food crisis? Or I see uh, David has also already answered a bit my question, um, because of course it's also about commitments, but then it would be like, if it's about commitment, it's funds lying around, not yet allocated to projects. So how, how would you, envision this tagging to uh, help with this particular timeliness uh, issue. Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks very much. And I think that that goes back into identifying bilaterally with our partners, how they're identifying this contingency financing within their current systems. And I think that, you know, some we'll just 
as a result of initial um, a stock take that we did a few months ago, they are reporting this data with, within IATI, but it, it's getting a bit convoluted within these uh, these commitments and disbursements. It's not it's not uh, discreetly identified. I mean, so it is happening. If it's not happening on IATI, it's happening internally, and we also want to work with these partners to uh, to push the usage of of the IATI system to go from this internal reporting to a a more uh, systematized public facing uh, system. But again, it's going to be, require some some bilateral discussions and some some sifting through of, of what's there and and how we can parse this out and into exactly what we're looking for. Um, I don't know if Stephen wants to, to follow that up related to the taggings. No, th thank you, Michael. I think I think again it's a really good challenge because uh, it's certainly not presenting that using the tag element in the ASI standard is going to solve this at all. But there's a diff that there is as as Alex pointed out as well that there, there's a there's a, a difference between the broad searches we're trying to make and trying to find all the projects to do potentially with FNS and then those very targeted responses. So I, I think here in the second phase we might have some uh, success and challenge in trying to find the targeted funding for that. But uh, but along the way we want to know we want to know is this is this relevant and useful in using a use of the ATI standard as well. So um, yeah, I think I think it's helpful, and the, and I think the other bit is the same challenge then applies to other things, climate financing, etc., yeah. etc. It's trying to these. We had a session with Zach from GAFS. At the, I think it was the last VCE or the one before around cross-cutting themes and IAT. So uh, you know, how, how do you find how do you find data that's across many sectors, for example, and and, and this is just one of those. So I think like the community of practice thinking about ways to do this. Uh, maybe there are much smarter ways than I am uh, using machines and AI and stuff to do this. But let's 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 work with tags to begin with. I think <laughs> might be a way. I've got one more question, John, and I know we've got a couple of minutes left. Uh, well, Marianne from uh, World Vision, um, you, you're saying that we already do label with uh, F FS food security and nutrition in your own sectors. I think that's like World Vision sec internal sectors, and so you could add something about this. Uh, and then the question of do GAFs with, work with the START network and World Vision? So, Marion, I don't know if you're here to just add anything to that um, whilst I keep an eye on the time. If if you can't speak, I don't. It's a, if you can't, have we got the setup to speak? Don't worry. So, I think the thing for Marion there, World Vision, as many organisations do, have their own sector codes, and maybe maybe there's another way through this to have a, another sector coding in vocabulary, but. We should be minded, as Alex pointed out, of all the all the different ways we could do this. Absolutely, and I think you know we're well, as one of you mentioned. This is a bit of an iterative process as as we come in with, um, you know, new suggestions of, of how we can better track food and nutrition security data. We are more than willing to apply those to the existing methodology. It's something that we can adapt to continuously. Uh, better track this data. In terms of the partnership with, with World Vision, I'll, I'll hand that one over to Genevieve, who's our, who's our GAFS expert here. Thanks for that, Don. To my knowledge, um, I'm not sure if we've actually had the pleasure of engaging with World Vision, um, but I, I think that the great part about GAFS is it's a highly inclusive process. And so, Frankly, the more the merrier. Um, to, if you have any recommendations about particular individuals that we should engage from, from Start Network or World Vision, uh, we welcome your suggestions. I think that puts us right at about 1010. Um, I'm sure there are other questions or, or other comments related to the presentation. Um, maybe, Sander, uh, will our uh, contact information be available to the participants via the uh, the the VCE platform and because it just had to leave but I think oh, okay. I think that's all available in the lobby area. Yeah, okay so great well please yeah. feel free to reach out to us directly and we can answer any outstanding questions or, or address any issues thank you again for joining us today it's really been a pleasure to discuss this with you and we look forward to our continued collaboration Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you very much, Thank everyone. You.